translated from the original Armenian, Shahan Natali, The Turks and Us, in lieu of a preface, Concordance. For thousands and thousands of years, the Armenian people, their heads bowed, read the book of Genesis from the Hebrew Old Testament, the Bible, or Breath of God, as a prayer book and on bended knee, they wandered in the deserts without even once creating their own Moses, who would part the sea and lead them to transcribe the Armenian Genesis. Throughout the millennia, Armenians read it aloud and prayed with in earnest supplication, but were unable to draw a comparison of the massacres by the pharaohs with the blood feasts of the sultans. And to conclude that if the Egyptian horrors had given birth to Moses and the Ten Commandments, how it was that the Turkish terrors did not give birth to one Moses, who would give them at least one concordance. Perhaps the Turkish atrocities were so powerful that they deprived the Armenian womb from the ability to fertilize even one embryo. Perhaps, if, however, that is the testimony, woe be to that people who, as a response to antiquated virtues, has absurdity as its agonizing murmur. But I, who believe it is unnatural and the negation of universal law that human blood should not swell, and the martyrs, more than the sand of the sea, should not erupt from the deserts, am writing the new Genesis, the concordance of the Armenians. My message is to those who are young, young in spirit, and free from the judgments of fading brains, to those who were baptized in the desert sands, and today wage the battle of their existence against the city swamps, to those, weary of counting corpses, who today have the audacity to prevent their hearts from palpitating against cadaverization, to those who, receiving nourishment from the bones of their relatives, survived and today are being poisoned by white bread, to those who left the corpses of their fathers unburied, lost trace of their mothers in the desert, saw the sale of their sister's honor in the Turkish bazaars, and, trampling on the tormented corpses of their brothers, fled as if possessed, to those who escaped from the ashen ruins of their vibrant cottages and quaffed their thirst from the blood gushing from their wounds, to those who drank the fecal poison of the orphans and of the exiles from horizon to horizon, and finally, to those who today and every day struggle against death, and as their holiest and only prayer, every night penetrate the filth of a straw mattress, tortured by the road they have walked. My message is to those among whom I see the undiscovered Moses of Armenian suffering and the Armenian Israel, who knows how to cross the desert and part the seas in pilgrimage toward the promised land. There is one vengeance alone, and Armenians are its apostles. Worship no god but revenge. Chapter 1 The causes for all our tragedies are others. Every day and everywhere, in tens of newspapers and hundreds of gatherings about Armenian tragedies of global proportions, the reader and listener hear only one thing. The causes for all our tragedies are others. What stories we don't know about Russia. Is there even a babe in his cradle who hasn't heard Lobanov's Armenia without Armenians? How little we know about England who cannot raise its battleships to the crest of Ararat. What of Germany who would not trade a bone of a German soldier for the entire Armenian nation? And what of France, Italy, America? That is to say, which one? Are these stories falsehoods? Categorically, no. They are all true. But it is equally true that all the causes for the Armenian tragedies are not in those stories. However, our editors, orators, and activists have repeated these stories so often that the Armenian people, the political ranks, and even their own preachers, knowingly or unknowingly, don't ask any more. And we, Armenians, have we no fault in our own tragedies? Our constant lamentation always about others without self-reflection, in our opinion, 
has been the ultimate tragedy of the Armenian people. Through these lenses, and based on self-criticism, we will attempt to demonstrate how many faults we have, as a result of which only the consequences can be attributed to others. Faults and crimes, whose stories have begun to lose their flavor, have been of no help to us, and have turned us into story-telling grannies. An innately romantic people we have considered as truth that which we have desired, which Western Armenian has not seen the uncle, meaning the spy, on his mountains. But let's set aside the old stories for now. Which Armenian today does not witness the economic, physical and political demise of Turkey? Pick up any Armenian newspaper at random and you will read about abuse, mistrust of the outside world, decrease in live births, political defeats. If these are correct but one time, let us be sincere and objective by saying that in their reports are our tenfold subjective longings. We are acquainted with activists who determine the fate of Armenian political life, who have forgotten the tragedy of the Armenian people's extermination, and who are convinced they have undertaken the work of saving the Armenian nation by collecting the interests on the increase of Turks, or by writing articles about the existence of a few hundred thousand Turks or Kurds in certain areas as evidence of Turkish decay, when in fact there is not even a single Armenian in those places. What does this illustrate? That the same Armenian political mind has committed and is committing the calamity of appreciating the Turkish stewed rice more than the Armenian nothing. And when they are told that all those proofs and reports albeit true, another truth is that today decimated Turkey lives, while we are dying. In the life of nations, decades are but blinks of the eye, they reply, and they don't realize that as applicable as this comment may be for the Armenians, it is equally true for the Turks. Moreover, in the case of their survival, this comment is as direct a parallel for the Turks as it is a deviant analogy for our life in the case of death. The accounts about retreat from the gates of Vienna and from Spain all the way to the shores of the Bosphorus are so long and boring that they do not allow time or heart to bellow that after all. Don't we also have 40 million stories to tell? Finally, without prolonging the saddest of stories and delving into Byzantine revenge, let us declare that the principal cornerstone of Armenian political ideology, internally and externally, has been every beneficial proof for us and every non-beneficial proof for the Turk. We hope that there are no doubts about this. In our opinion, this is the first source of our collective misfortunes. The Turks are ignorant, the Armenians intelligent, Turks are barbaric, Armenians civilized, Turks are tradeless, Armenians professional, Turks are impoverished, Armenians affluent, and even to the point of Turks are not diplomats, Armenians politically astute. Consequently, Turks are dying, Armenians will survive. The man who committed the greatest crime against Armenian political destiny is he who fitted these lenses on Armenian eyes for the first time, and who over the course of time blinded us to such a degree that we cannot see truths in their true colors. Is it possible to imagine the measure of our blindness when, for example, the Armenian editor, son of a villager, declared that Sultan Hamid was not a diplomat? There is your proof. Through our reappraisal, it is our intent to examine a series of proofs, setting aside those lenses colored by our desires. And contrary to our justified and unrelenting hatred and revenge against Turanism, to demonstrate what advantages Turks have over us. The main cause of our defeats is in not knowing the advantage of the enemy's strengths, and moreover, in only acknowledging his weaknesses. This is the reason that we have often waged battles with erroneous militarism, and by having only acknowledged the pedestrian Turk, we have cast ourselves in the open field, unaware of the enemy cannon, which is trained on our position from behind the hill and has bombarded us. 
Inevitably, the result would be our defeat, no matter how heroic our efforts. Know your enemy's weakness in order to attack him from that side. This comment is not a totality and can be devastating. One must complete the statement by adding, cognizant of the power waiting at his side. We have heard much about the Turks' weakness. Painfully, all those weaknesses about which we talk incessantly are redundant parrotings of the English, French, Russian and German statements about the Turks. We forget that we are Armenians. And that which is a weakness for the Englishman is a power for us. Therefore, our analysis will be remote from evidence written in European volumes. Armenian life is a sea of bloody evidence. We are going to row on our bloody waves and to see with Armenian eyes the Turks as they are, standing with the Armenians. Enough of looking out at the Turkish minaret from the top of the Eiffel Tower and ridiculing its height. Eiffel is becoming to the French. Our place is the roof of a ruined church dome whence we must view the minaret, so we can comprehend that its height is sufficient for a fatal fall. Our bones are the witnesses. Therefore, let us observe the Turks with Armenian lenses. Chapter 2 Ideology of the Armenian Struggle The Armenian-Turkish War was inevitable. Our bloody history and volumes have more than justified and established the justification and inevitability of our struggle. And we fought. Let us also declare that in this fight we were defeated. Admitting our defeat neither negates the justice of the struggle nor diminishes the heroism of the Armenian freedom fighter, who was equal to the legend of the brave warrior against forty demons. Why were we defeated? Volumes will respond more about those external causes which have played a great role in our defeats. The Russians betrayed us. They wanted to dominate the road toward the Mediterranean without the Armenian and promoted that plan, on the one hand by encouraging us, and on the other hand having us slaughtered by the Turks. The English sold us out with their eastern policies and for their economic gains. After occupying Kilikia with our weapons and bloodshed, the French abandoned us, unarmed, in the face of the Turkish yoke to gain their friendship. Considering Smyrna theirs, the Italians gave the Turks armaments to expel the Greeks and set us on fire. The Americans lulled us with their eloquence and sacrificed our cause for the sake of a few oil wells. These are only examples, behind each of which there is a horrific tragedy, which the youngest Armenian child and the illiterate old woman can recount. Are these not the events they have witnessed and felt on their very bodies? But everyone knows all of this. Let us discuss some other causes, because although the causes are attributed to the outsiders, in our opinion, these are not the only causes of our defeat. They played their calamitous role later. The primary and destined cause was among us. What was the basis and principle of our fight? to be free men, masters of our sweat, and live with honour and advance with our national values. The Turks were not to know our oath through our means. Many before us, Greeks, Serbs, Bulgarians, Romanians, had come out publicly and achieved their goals, to the detriment of the Turks. The Turks had comprehended the significance of this fight, which had impacted their very being in the form of a fight for existence. Therefore, for the Turks and for us, the principle of this struggle was inevitable and familiar. Isn't it interesting which side is just and which side is unjust? The proof is in the struggle, especially since our history is full of bloody manifestations that, in a struggle, winning justice is not a sufficient condition. So, unfortunately, from the first day that we Armenians declared war, we mimicked only what the Balkan people had done. In order not to be misunderstood and not to yield to sad provocation, 
we underscore the word only, because no vengeance would we have copied, them, their armaments, the manner of their defiance. If one would want to foment rebellion, the vengeance must be around one issue. If we made a declaration, while adopting the armaments and strategies of those peoples liberated before us, we should also have had Armenianists. For if it is true that the Greeks, Serbs, Bulgarians and Romanians had a common enemy, the Turks, they had experienced the same outrage and massacres, they had the same emancipation ideology as the Armenians. It is even more correct to say that they also had differences. They were Greeks, Serbs, Bulgarians and Romanians. We were Armenians. They were in Europe. We were in Asia. Our emancipating trailblazers overlooked these two essential differences with their many subdivisions, and this disregard played an inevitable role in our defeat. Let not this declaration be construed as a denial of their memory, which draws its sanctity from the concept of liberation. No mistake can diminish that. However, after experiencing such bloody stories, even in the name of the most self-sacrificing awe, not chronicling this flaw would be to perpetuate the uselessness of the blood which was shed, and which is to be shed. For this, the greatest emancipation and Armenia itself are still insufficient. If, however, our fathers use their inexperience as justification for their failure, we, their offspring, are even guiltier that we did not correct the mistake in the face of the bloody events. In our opinion, we, who were born and grew in bloodshed, have created from our father's mistake a horrific calamity, and we perpetuate it when in our orations, even today, we nourish our people only with accounts about the Greeks, Serbs, Bulgarian and Romanian peoples, when we base our exaggerated encouraging speeches only on the massacres they endured, when we repeat and repeat the stories of the quarter-million liberated Greeks to give jumbled hopes to our listeners. If assurance is a good thing, it is equally bad and calamitous when its foundations are unstable. This is the first mistake, begun by our fathers and turned by us to calamity, which we bear by intensifying its force, repeating the same sermons with the same words, or ignorantly, not having learned from the oceans of blood, and worse, with the crime of conscious and calamitous reassurance. If we see that Armenians are not alone, but foremost in this mistake, we bear responsibility for it. Here is the second inevitable mistake. Our fathers did not comprehend that when the Turk, Greek, Serb, Bulgarian and Romanian peoples emerged from rebellions and liberating struggles with the loss of land and millions of victims, they also learned a great deal. What did the Turks learn from all of that? One horrific thing, that the principal weapon of their victory was in the Armenian-Turkish fight. They learned that the Balkans are in Europe where no matter the magnitude of their barbarism on multitudes, they could hardly succeed in uprooting the collective native population. And they were defeated, because their battlefield was on the land of the villages and cities, inhabited and protected by insurgent groups, and not independent of their will, on the basis of annihilating peoples. The Armenians and Armenia, on the other hand, were situated in Asia, and consequently the battlefront was favourable to the Turks. Moreover, as a result of the previous defeats, the Turks also had to change their military tactics and weaponry. To know these things means to know a great deal about combat and securing victory. If it were not in our power to change the battlefront, it was in our power to know the enemy's weapon, which would have changed a great deal from our situation. And so the battle began. Chapter 3. Inevitability of the Armenian Struggle. Let us repeat. The battle was inevitable. We had to fight with our teeth bared if we wanted to live as humans, 
and we fought more than epically because we wanted to live as human beings. We were humans with every worth than any human under the sun. Blessed be the memory of those who declared the sanctity of revolution with their blood. Let us examine the weaponry and the manner of fighting which were used in this tremendous fracas. We didn't have an army like our enemy. That was not our fault. We were facing cannons and sophisticated rifles with six shooters. That was our capability. We didn't have generals with advanced military training. Our general was the Armenian son, the son of stone, the beloved freedom fighter. That was our possibility. To say and advise that we should have waited then until we had an army, cannon and general, would be to ignorantly deny that proof that the Turks would not wait. Therefore, to wait would mean to lose the Armenians and Armenia as well, and the Turks knew this very well. No cannon, no general, no army were victorious yesterday against our slingshot-bearing freedom fighters, no matter how great was their role and how great it was in the battle. Peru's Armenian and foreign newspapers of the last half-century, and you will read one thing, alas, only one thing, that the Turkish government slaughters, slaughtered the peaceful Armenian villager, the Armenian child, and elder, that is, the people. For forty years we witnessed the evidence, and we filled the world with pathetic stories, until the name of the Armenians was equated with a slaughtered world, a fearful rabbit, and at best, a bread-begging orphan. Such is the horrific calamity of the Armenian blunder, in which the outsider has no fault, or very little, because, first of all, it was we who had to see the knowledge of our enemy in this battle. In reality, the Turkish cannon did not defeat our slingshot. Rather, it was our watchword, which was mortally defeated by the Turks' motto, Death to the Armenian. That became the standard of the Turks in the Armenian-Turkish wars. Death to the Sultan, the Pasha, the Governor, and the Regime. That was the standard of the Armenian. Now peruse the pages of the history of our struggles. The Armenians are always victorious in the battles they wage, both against individuals and even against regimes. And the Turks, defeated as individuals, are always victorious as a nation. Our mistake, our calamitous mistake, was not to see this evidence and not to fight against the Turks with their weapons was a crime that we were the first, the very first, to perpetrate against the physical existence of our nation, and we were destined, independently from all external plans, to be defeated as a nation and politically, because we responded to the blow directed at the Armenian nation by delivering a blow to the Turk individual, let us accept the fact that we were defeated as a nation and politically, and let us not be ashamed to declare also our responsibility. And let us bring to an end the declamations about quality and quantity, because the deceased, no matter how sanctified, cannot find reconciliation. The weeds that grow on their burial mounds belong to two-legged animals, nor are their dissipated talents worth more than a mite. Their homes and properties are more befitting to the brigand. This is the judgment of the world in political life. Could we have used the same weapon? That is, when the Turks were indiscriminately slaughtering the Armenians, could we not also have slaughtered the Turks indiscriminately within our abilities? Yes, and we should have done it. Whoever wishes to argue this point, we reply with the same trouble-provoking frankness. Either the words of chivalry were deceitful. Don't be afraid, sister dear, the brave freedom fighter will not lay hands on women. And the events were play-acting, in which the group leader threatened death, and punished with death the freedom fighter who laid hands on women and children. Or we could have, and had opportunities, no matter how small in scope and possibilities, to slaughter women, children, the elderly, and the unarmed.
but we did not do it. And we should have done it in reply to Hamid's policy, which strove to annihilate the Armenian nation and not to punish the Armenian insurgents. We could have done it, and were obligated to do the same during the days of the treasonous constitution. But in the face of the massacres of Kilikia, Ardana, we responded only with ancient weapons, and the hanging of a few Hassabs paid for the blood of 20,000 Armenians. Once again, we could have and should have used the same weapon during the war in all those areas where our hand could reach, and our hand reached all the way to Erzurum and Erzinka. If our hand did not prevent Bolshevism, and as a result of it our bloody retreat, it was in our hand to prevent being struck from behind in that area, not only by the Turkish military forces, but also the elderly, the children, and the women. Do not answer that Russian rule existed and would punish us with death. It's possible that individuals would be punished by death, but we are speaking about doing it nationally, and a nation would not be punished, just as the Turkish nation was not punished. Whoever insists that we could not do it, in our opinion, is one of those who bears individual responsibility and falls into generalizations in order to cover up his own faults. We do not want to wallow in crimes. We declared and are convinced that we could have and with our own forces. Because we know and have heard with these ears from the mouth of the common man that we could have done the same in Baku, where we were and where we had filled tens of thousands of Turks in military barracks. Oh, criminal gentlemen, we had stationed guards at the doors so that during the days of this chaotic confusion, the slaughterers of Armenians would remain safe from the most just Armenian revenge. And they remained safe and lived like gentlemen while the streets of Baku were smeared with the blood of 25,000 Armenians. We could have and were obligated during the days of Turkish occupation to do so much so that the Turkish people would have been unable to create Kemal and Kemalism, and this we could have done only by ourselves. But we were satisfied with arresting about a hundred individuals and, oh, criminal naivete, to turn them over to England, then to put the blame on England so as to forget that England was not as much a denier by expelling our blood from Malta as we were by turning them over to England, and finally we could and should have destroyed Kemal and Kemalism when we were sitting in Constantinople, Smyrna and Kilikia, and our hands reached into the depths of the province. And if we did not do it, if we did not use that weapon, which we had the justifiable right to use for forty years, and with pathetic and irresponsible parroting, we declared Kemal a brigand and Kemalism a dream. Not to lag behind Lord Cecil, let us admit and declare that we are responsible ahead of Lord Cecil, that the Turks became stronger, and that Smyrna and its population burned in conflagration. This picture is in no way the denial of foreign plots and corruption, but only an early harvest from the general responsibilities on our part. We can write thousands of volumes, and we've written about those events, to proclaim the Turks as beasts, criminals, thieves, whatever you want, and it is not wrong, but all of that does not change the evidence that they are, as a nation, and politically, more savvy and emerged more clever in the Armenian-Turkish struggle, because the Armenians, independently from all external circumstances, did not know and did not want to use the weapon of victory. And we were defeated, because we should have been defeated. Chapter 4 Building a Nation Once, and only once, after being subjected to the slaughters of forty years, during the Armenian-Turkish battle for existence, did the Armenians show the true weapon for creating a nation. And that was the cleansing within the boundaries of Armenia, which, let anyone claim what he wants, occurred during the days of the Armenian Republic 
and whose only result is today's Armenian majority on a parcel of land, which, although Bolshevik, is Armenia today, and the Armenian people, a nation. Politically a nation and a homeland mean only a homogeneous majority on a determined piece of land. Other parameters about nation and homeland are complementary embellishments and the frames of the essence of that image. That is why, in our opinion, the Armenianization of Armenia is a greater act and has greater significance than the creation of Armenia as a government. In order not to give way to argument and provocation, let us merely declare that our declaration is neither negation nor denial of the nation creating heroic battles of Sarikamish and Sadarabad, but our conviction that from a governmental standpoint, the cleansing of Zangi Bazaar was a greater step. And what is amazing is that, until today we have been fearful to make this known, with open forehead. We have banged our head from wall to wall and have fallen into sophomoric declamations fearfully by minimizing and blurring our only nation-building act. It is clear for us that there will be many uproar raisers against this affirmation of ours, and they will proclaim us as criminal from the left and from the right. Did not many do this at that time from the podium of Parliament? Did not the Dashnaks, members of the governmental party, even do it with frightened complaints? And today, oh, today, who cannot say more, during these tumultuous days of mentally diminished sophists? To all comments, however, our answer is only one. Read the history of nation-building. We just want to make a few comments about one thing, because that one thing can blur the vision of those eyes to be open to the truth. That is, that many will proclaim, with this affirmation, what the Turks have done yesterday and today are right. Then why should we protest against them, since they also deem this the road to nation-building? Here is our answer to all those who think this way. Yes, the Turks took the right road toward building the Turkish nation, and our protests against their steps only provoke the ridicule of history, all nations, and the Turks. No one has protested as sweetly as the Armenians, and no one has lost as much or suffered as much outrage as the Armenians. No matter how much we protest, Whatever is going to happen, will happen. The Turks also protested, but what was to happen happened when we, at least one time, knew to do the right thing. And because the Turks are much wiser, disproportionately more knowledgeable in political correctness, let not the tasteless concept be repeated that the step similar to ours irritates the Turks. On that ground, the Turks have nothing to learn from us. We must learn from them the lesson of nation-building. Alas, however, during forty years we only learned our lesson well only once. Unfortunately, however, those who learned that lesson correctly did not deepen their knowledge of nation-building. And once again, we must declare fearlessly that all the apologetic orations, at least for us, serve to conceal the reality that we did not want, we did not want, and not, we could not. It is possible to say much about external conditions, but all of those cannot negate that, which we know, that is, that we could but we did not want to. As for the proprietors of today, the Armenian Bolsheviks, no matter how much they are the servants of Moscow, by all unprofitable conditions bearing a governmental and political name, Armenia, represent a value and only draw the strength of their international mottos from that terminology. They certainly would neither have a chair, nor bread, nor word, if that nation-building crime were not committed. They have such diminished mental capacity that they could not and did not want to understand that today's nation and homeland was created only by those means. So once again, after the lessons of a million victims, after the experience of forty bloody years, we have once again fallen on the same erroneous path.
which certainly is going to cost us the basic annihilation of this nation, it is outside the realm of possibility that in the face of unconditional and independent steps of the Turks to create a Turkish nation, our attempts at spouting human proletarian mottos are nothing more than the repetition of past mistakes. The mistake of responding to the slaughter of the Armenian people with the elimination of individuals as atonement for the slaughter and annihilation of the remaining Armenian people. Perhaps our viewpoint is correct, no matter how horrific it may be, or the acts of the Turks are false. Let us set aside once and for all the evidence of the Kemalist period, the bloody road of Kemal's policies, his accomplices' violent activity, linking a handful of Armenians with all the links of the Turkish chain. Unfortunately, our viewpoint and the Turkish works, which are being realized every day before our eyes, are correct, and in front of them, our deplorable and disgusting complaints, our revolting sophistries, giving advice to the Turks cannot shed from our shoulders our part of the responsibility for future crimes, independent from the responsibility of the outside world. We had more than enough pretensions of changing the course of histories and laws of nations. Let our experience of at least forty years as witnesses suffice. It is not in books that we read it, but we bore it on our bodies, and we are obliged to comprehend it as it is. Even if the road is full of crimes, that is not our fault. It belongs to history and to the law. All have walked down that road, all proceed by that law, and it is not we who are going to change that, because the verdict has been rendered that we are either going to live or die. In order to live, we are going to walk with the living and like them. Otherwise, death is inevitable for us, and our daily cries are nothing more than the screams of one in agony, to demonstrate that we have not yet learned to walk like those who have mastered the science of living and that we are being trampled under their feet. Let us not repeat banal phrases, nor look for solace in those maxims that a nation cannot be lost by forceful means, just as a nation lives, so it can die. The means, by force or peacefully, can insert variety in the expression of agony, but both do not cease from serving as a means to the same purpose. Death is death in a peaceful bed, when the heart is unable to send life-giving blood everywhere, or when the heart, violently pulsating because of a bullet wound, spurts out the blood with force until it runs dry. Our dogmatic sermons against Turkish means not only do not secure our lives, but only declare our willingness to die by peaceful means. And it is pathetically naive and more ignorant than the criminal to declare that we Armenians know better the Turkish gain and are more sincere toward it. After at least forty years of history, here is our backwardness, for which we are responsible, independently from the course of results emanating from foreign and external plots and conspiracies. Before giving a lesson to the Turks, we need to take many lessons from them in the science of nation-building. Chapter 5 Failures of Nation-Building Our responsibilities in the failed results of nation-building are numerous and deep. Speaking about foreign plots only will have value when we do not strive to shirk our responsibilities on their account. Bolsheviks and Turks, hand in hand, extinguished the dawn of freedom for the Armenian people. This evidence is sufficient, so that no one will try to say that we negate the dark plot by the Bolsheviks and Turks to kill Armenians. But why should we not declare that, during the shaping of their plans, we have had many faults. Did we not proclaim Armenia's independence from the first day by word and press more than did Switzerland? Did we not deem the Bolsheviks who had escaped from their countries and sought refuge in Armenia as political fugitives? Did we not know Armenian Bolsheviks who, having escaped from Russia, received positions in our agencies? 
We do not state all these proofs to negate the fact that in spite of them we would have been able to evade foreign plots, but we must confess that these proofs in some measure facilitated and hastened that tragedy for which we must assume part of the responsibility. In our opinion, May 1st would hardly have occurred if we had not allowed the Armenian Bolsheviks, not only from entering our agencies, but even our borders. Unfortunately, our proofs regarding foreign conspiracies demonstrate that we had allowed them to penetrate even our army. So this is what we must confess that as justified as we were to blame in pressuring the May 1st rebellion, we were equally to blame and responsible for the preparation and creation of May 1st. This declaration in no way means that we negate the responsibility of forces outside our capabilities, but the failure within our capabilities, which, if it basically could not prevent treason, could at least emphasize our responsibility. If we could not prevent many things outside, such as many plots and treason in London, Paris or Washington, let us confess that we could have prevented them in Yerevan. But we, in the name of freedom of speech, were allowing a few populists in Yerevan to write without restraint whatever they wanted, and even post-conspiratorial yaftas inviting the overthrow of the government at all cost on the walls of Yerevan. And if tomorrow the blood-drenched history of the Armenians is repeated in Armenia, no matter how great the responsibility of the outsider, it cannot be more deeply rooted than that of the Armenian Bolsheviks, who allow the Turkish bestiality and plots to penetrate the veins of a handful of suffocating people. The Turks march to the watchword, not a single Armenian. The Armenian responds with the motto, Turkish friend. And tomorrow, when the blood flows once again, the Armenian Bolshevik will be responsible ahead of Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey and Russia. Just as yesterday the Armenian Dashnak was responsible for deeming the Bolshevik conspirator as a political harasser. We are not so stupid, a responsible Bolshevik said to me one day, so as to allow Dashnaks to go to Armenia, because that way we will repeat their mistake. These words would have had their significance if the Armenian Bolshevik did the same toward the Turks. Finally, understanding that the most pure-blooded Turkish proletarian is more subversive toward Armenians and Armenia than the most anti-proletarian, Dashnak. How much we have to learn from the Turks. And if that were to be our course, if we were going to come finally from Sevres to Lausanne, certainly we would not have come to Lausanne without aiming a bullet from the fortress of Kars on our way and sending a tearful letter to the gates of Lausanne Palace. No prophylactic can eradicate this political leprosy from the Armenian forehead. We could have been vanquished, we have no argument, but we should have done this by making our defeat worth more than victory. It is here, therefore, that our responsibility comes to light, independently from all foreign plots. We could have been, one day, obliged to come to Lausanne. Lausanne may greatly be the result of foreign plots, but to come to Lausanne with a tearful letter is only the horrific leprosy of Armenian temperament. Who prevented Aharonian from coming to Lausanne with a bomb instead of a piece of paper? The logical consequence of the inertia of not aiming a bullet from the car's fortress was a tearful piece of paper. The greatest tragedy is in this system. The atonement of a plot by a Jordania and a Ramishvili was in a bullet by an Igor. Who broke the forearm of a new Igor in the face of a more dishonorable fall of the same cars from Yerevan to Lausanne? If we could not prevent Lausanne, we could erase the crime of Lausanne. Is this declaration so audacious? Only those who do not find the sea of Armenian blood as vast as creating a more sacred audacity can think this way. And as to those who will have the ability to gossip that similar steps cannot sentence the destiny of issues, we reply, 
strike out with a black line those heroic incidents toward which we still uphold with sacred awe. The entrance and victorious return to Lausanne by an Ismet Pasha, independently from foreign plots, will remain one of the blackest marks on the Armenian forehead. Lausanne subjected Armenians to a test of their manhood. All of those precautions with which they filled the world in those days are proof that even outsiders anticipated a heroic manhood from the Armenians. And we disappointed them. In this case, the outsider bears no responsibility. In this case, the Turk bears no responsibility. Because the Armenian sacred criminal did not come forth against the Turkish criminal, here is the key of that ridicule which greets us everywhere, contrary to all of our outcries and efforts. Let it not be said that Lausanne would remain Lausanne still. We reply, we have no evidence about this, yet we have countless proofs of the emptiness of your opinions, and even if for a moment we choose not to even argue around this point, one thing we can say very clearly is that Lausanne could remain Lausanne, but without Ismet or the Lausanne criminals. And this would not only diminish a worthy successor to Mustafa Kemal, but would show to the face of the entire world the manhood of the Armenian spirit. If the Turkish people were able to make the road of its crimes reach Lausanne with its chief criminal Ismet, with all its bloodshed, the Armenian people was unable to make an Aharonian into a bomber. In this instance, Armenians are so responsible that it is shameful to speak of foreign responsibility, and there are as many similar proofs in the last decade of our life which could have created for us an age of epic heroism if the Armenian soul had not internalized the motto Dishonorable Life Above Honorable Death. Chapter 6. Death of a Nation Do nations die? Yes. History is the witness, and all peoples without homelands are sentenced to die. Because a nation cannot exist without a homeland, and there is no homeland, without a nation. These are two sides of the same subject. But it is an incredibly stubborn self-deception that during their speeches about history, the preachers of the Armenian people enumerate the names of dead nations, and then immediately afterward insist that we will not die. The inner meaning of this self-deception is understandable, but it is enough of tumbling inside impotent words. We feel the claws of death on the throat of each of us. This persistent self-deception gains its power primarily from two sources. First, that Armenian life is counted by millennia. And second, the ossified conviction we have, one knows not how, that a nation does not die by forceful means. It seems that the main reason for this conviction is that Armenians have been subject to forceful means, and we have wanted to create a belief to counteract the consequences of proven death by force. Unfortunately, both of these ideas are unstable, because to live a thousand years has not yet demonstrated immortality, nor does the belief we have about forceful means negate death by force. Let us not go into the dust of history to aggravate the sicknesses of dying nations and the cause of their death, because as much as we argue and enumerate reasons, no one will be able to deny that in the line of reasoning there has not been perhaps the destined death by force. It is sufficient to subject the contemporary example of the Armenian people to a brief examination, because even if the centuries have changed, the symptoms of impending death remain the same. No matter how sad and terrifying this examination, we're obliged to do it, because the evil of such thinking for which we are responsible has not been small. With this thought inspiring hope to him who finds himself facing death, we have not seen our ability to arouse in him the vigor to resist, and instead we have killed it. And this ultimate evil, in our opinion, particularly in the case of Armenians, 
has always been greater than the benefit of despair. Let every Armenian individual examine himself. Did Armenians die as a nation through forceful strangulation, and are they dying today or not? Today there is no Turkish Armenia and no Turkish Armenians. No matter what we write about the Armenians, scattered in all parts of the world, and about the preservation of their existence, no matter what we try, it is useless. Armenians are sentenced to die. Let us repeat, to minimize argument and provocation, that this declaration is not the denial of efforts made in this direction, but rather the proclamation of their wastefulness. Already we are gradually feeling that our efforts are unnatural, that teaching the Armenian language to the Armenian youth born in America, France and even Syria, who has not drawn memory and strength from the stones and soil of the homeland, does not signify his political Armenianness. We are obliged to reconcile ourselves also to the fact that those efforts are not just, no matter how many emotionally justifiable aspects they may have. A small incident. One day in America, with spirited emphasis, a father, Armenian to his marrow, involved in responsible activities, and a dashnak was questioning me. My son is 24 years old, he received higher education and is going to pursue his specialization. You know about my Armenian spirit and my efforts to make him Armenian. I taught him to read and write Armenian and to speak Armenian at home. But from the result of these decade-long efforts, I see that he is dead as a political Armenian. I have often asked him with palpitation, Gefok, when we go to Armenia, I won't go. He has interrupted me without allowing me to finish my sentence. I am American. And teary-eyed I have thought long, can I take him to Armenia? How, and finally, is my demand justified? And I have found that I am not justified in my demands, not only from the viewpoint of taking him to Armenia, but am also unjustified in sacrificing the man in my son because of my own emotions. And my son himself has made me feel the latter by declaring that he, in his preparations as an American, is less than his fellow Americans, insofar as he has wasted energy learning Armenian because of his father's and mother's insistence. Now he no longer speaks Armenian, he no longer reads Armenian, and he is in no way interested in Armenian community life, and he does this consciously to equalize his powers with those of his friends. He does not want to lag behind them, to be defeated, and therefore conscious about focusing energy, he often, and even in a rebuking tone, throws back in my face my evil, to prevent even one word of relief from my Armenian spirit. You can generalize this example, and because this same reality is emphasized more or less everywhere witness our complaints about degeneration and loss, a series of encouraging events remain only as exceptions. No matter how burdensome and fatal this may be for us, the evidence does not change. And even if we succeed a few years from now to vest our wishes upon those proofs, our children will make us feel it. And so every day we will waste away, wear down, and die. A little faster in France, a little more slowly in Syria, but the result will be the same. What is the difference between America and Turkey? One does not see a need for a yoke, because it offers numerous means, and we are resigned to our death in the face of these means, with the gasping consolation of a peaceful death. But let us not forget that we have accepted the fact that we will die. The other does not have American means, culture, and yet it replaces the knowledgeable nation-building know-how and culture of the American with the yoke, spurning the title of criminal. And we stubbornly persist with the tragic mindset 
that we will not die, consoling ourselves with, a nation does not die by forceful means. The evidence is that we died by the million, and our insistence in the face of this annihilation will not ever change the horrific proof. The desire to live is still not enough to live. One needs to have the knowledge of how to live. It is understandable. Our comments are about the survival of a nation and a homeland, and the Turks have a centuries-old stockpile of that knowledge, and the new Turks are disproportionately more adept than the Armenians have been, and are likely to be, if they continue to stubbornly cling to the old road. Let us not explain the reasons. They do not change the evidence. If only we could have learned to view the evidence of how the Turks create a nation and a homeland, and how we are dying as a nation and homeland. If that is not going to revive the corpses of our fathers, it is going to give life to our children. If only once we'd known ourselves and accepted the more correct road taken by the Turks in the work of nation-building, which today still falls within the boundaries of our capability and responsibility, we would have also discovered that many external plots and conspiracies are the consequences of causes found among ourselves. Among other things, we would no longer ask why England and France protect the Turks, or why do others aid the Turks. Finally, let us understand that there is a law in everything, even if there is no justification. There is a capability, a value, which the outsiders appreciate. Let us know, finally, that in political life the law is the leader, and let us forget justice because, in the end, that which is called justice is but a relative term. That which is unjust for us is just for someone else. The existence of this knowledge is bitter for us. But what can we do about Sultan Hamid slaughtering 100,000, exterminating areas and changing languages, and the new Turks slaughtering by the million and with succeeding steps creating the Turkish nation, proving that they have a better knowledge of nation-building. It is bitter, very bitter, that in the 20th century, in this extraordinarily nation-building century, they proclaimed in more than an emphasized manner, my life in the death of another. And we were in the front row of the sentenced to give our lives for others. We witness this argument every day, and yet we persist in not comprehending it. We are still afraid to talk about it and, like a pretentious schoolboy, we persist in not attempting to learn anything from the Turks. Childishly, we cast stones at the leaves of the Turkish tree while they axe the trunk of the Armenian tree, and we assert that the Turks are dying while the Armenians are living. Why then so many tears and grief? Why such complaints and blame against the outsider? What pretension, then, not only to give lessons in politics to the Turk, and even as far as the Englishman, if a nation does not die by force, and the key to the secret of survival is among us? Alas, nevertheless, that nations die. Many died yesterday. Today we are also dying, and we are dying not because we are small, but because we are dreadfully ignorant in the science of nation-building, here also the Armenians bear a great responsibility, independently from the outsider's part, a responsibility of forty years of not learning anything from the death of the Armenian nation and the creation of the Turkish nation. Chapter 7. A Nation of Turks Are the Turks a nation or not? No infinity of hate or vengeance except for absolute stupidity, cannot accept that the Turks during the course of their entire existence were a nation of such character as they are today. And contrary to all of our desires and statistics, contrary to the loss of such vast expanses of land, it is only the Turks who are a nation. Let us accept that without craftsmanship, commerce, agriculture and wealth, the Turks who have undertaken frying themselves in their own oil deserting Constantinople and satisfied with Angora, are more of a nation than they have ever been. How did that happen? 
All of us Armenians know the answer. First and foremost, by slaughter, and then by trying to eliminate the minorities. Yesterday they attempted to eliminate them by turkifying them in language and psychology. The success was small, because the mouthful was big, and the Turkish stomach unaccustomed to digest it. But to deny their success altogether would have meant not to comprehend the useless efforts and cries against the Turkish-speaking Armenians scattered to the four winds. And if we have heart-rending shivers in the face of examples of those losing the language while maintaining the Armenian soul, let us confess that the multitude is great of the losers of spirit together with the language. And so, armed with the knowledge of nation-building, the Turkish brain, independently from all outside assistance and advice, because benefiting from outside assistance is also a capability, has crushed the indigestible bones and today is trying to digest the flesh. Contrary to all pessimism of speak Turkish, become a Turk, that the admonitions and efforts will fail, in our opinion, they will succeed. It is true that boorish means will create fury and reaction, but the ultimate success will remain with the Turks. And that day is no far off when we will see with our own eyes the results of those efforts, that they will not only speak Turkish, but will think and feel like Turks. And what about our efforts? Let us repeat, they are like the efforts of boys who stone the leaves of trees while their trunks are being axed. On this ground, all of our orations and meetings, without denying their value, are not going to go beyond temporary pastimes. And finally, if our efforts are to truly have national political value, what value do those have who have been uprooted, who do not speak Turkish but English, who speak French and German, who do not speak Armenian nor feel like Armenians? Was it worth such a waste only so that someone not speak Turkish but also not speak Armenian? For even hate for the sake of hate has value. But unfortunately we do not see that it is basic to accept at least this sacred hate in lieu of language. We do not see that the French and English-speaking Armenians are usually much less Armenian than the Turkish-speaking Armenians. We do not think that anyone would presume, only a decade later, to make an Armenian living in France speak Armenian. Or to imagine that, therefore, that these efforts of ours are only for a peaceful and unconscious death in the final analysis because no matter how many regretful comments we make, we are resigned and no vexation is evident within us. By nature we know that even if we are vexed, it will be of no use. Death is conscious immortality, and the sole purpose of our disclosing this shocking and cold reality is only to spare additional wasteful contentions of conscious death because immortality is in those contentions, and we will never be able to utilize our contentions to the point as long as our strength is scattered. The Turks have focused their strength on the real work, and within the confines of pastime, we have turned those things to be confined into our work. And here also, we are destined to be fatally defeated. The Turks allocate the majority of their budget to the Ministry of Internal Affairs, that is, to create a nation, which means to dig the grave of the outsider. The Armenians waste what they do not have on everything, except for digging even a ditch for self-protection. And when the Turks become a nation, we only see the outsider. When the Armenians die, again we only see the outsider. We do not argue that the outsider is present in both instances. Let us not also argue that the Turks and the Armenians exist, and that there is a tremendous difference between them in the system of creating a nation. Would we Turkish Armenians be able to develop a profile, no matter how deprived of national life we were, but with the energy emanating from our land and stones? Yes. A thousand times, yes, can we still today 
strive to develop the profile of a nation in this dispersed condition? Yes, but only during the period of the generation who witnessed the blood and slaughter with its own eyes. Thus is that which we did not grasp, do not grasp, and most horrific, we do not want to move, even though we grasp it. For such a deported and homeless Armenian people, fortunately, there is a handful of Armenians still living on life-giving piece of earth, and naturally receives its physiognomy from that land. No matter what is the color of that land, called Armenia, it is enough that there is a number of Armenians there. With its incongruous language, its morals violated, its color illegitimate. But the only place where, nevertheless, even the criminal Armenian represents legitimate political value. It is sad, but this is the verdict of national and governmental understanding. Is it possible to deny that the criminal Turkish porter, from a governmental standpoint, is a citizen, and from a political standpoint represents more value than one shred of Armenian talent? That is why we can only regard as a nation that sliver of land and the violated multitude of Armenians living on it. But what is the picture there? The same ignorance about nation-building. The Turks are increasing and are emphasized in Turkey while the Armenians are finished. In Armenia, the Armenians are diminishing, growing perplexed while Turkism is growing strong in a cauldron of mental poverty. Brotherhood and humanity became one brothel in that wrung-out land, where independence took espionage all the way to the military fronts, and Tavarishness nourishes Mehmedjis with Armenian blood. And tomorrow, when the built-up Turkish nation also buries that handful of Armenians, the freed gentlemen and comrades will once again curse the outsider, as if one hair of that outsider would be tickled by all of that. And what about our responsibility? N no, how can Armenians have fault and responsibility? All the fault lies with the outsider, and such orations about brotherhood, such care about friendship, about solidarity between Turks and Armenians. Yes, that is how hatred and bloodshed end. The Turks and Armenians are brothers. One must be a little diplomatic. One must even be covert, act like a friend, and deceive the Turks. The first ones are the degenerate brains. The second ones are the diplomats, and they believe. They believe themselves to be more cunning, more ingenious and statesmanlike than the Turks, to the degree of deceiving them. Is the outsider responsible for this pretense also? Chapter 8. Turkish-Armenian Relations Is Turkish-Armenian friendship possible? Today, no. And whoever insists to the contrary either does not know the Turks or does not know himself. More correctly, he knows neither the Turks nor himself. Unfortunately, however, there are not a few Armenians who with the pretentious diplomacy of deceiving the Turks amicably not only think but also work in that direction. If the Armenian Bolsheviks had done nothing else, the crime they committed by uniting with the Turks was to dip their hands in Armenian blood. Continuing this commission in the name of Turkish friendship and thus destroying a nation would be enough to consider them traitors in the work of nation-building. The belief that salvation is possible by friendship with the Turks, the pretense of deceiving the Turks through Turk-Armenian amicable politics, is a new inexplicable crime, which we will atone by the death of our nation. But the Armenian Bolsheviks are not those pretenders alone. We meet pretenders such as these in all colors of people, everywhere, from reverends to Dashnaks, from Constantinople to America, who believe that they are more politically astute and more cunning than the Turks, and can betray them to defeat on those grounds. There is no difference in essence between the Bolsheviks and the others in the principle of Turk-Armenian friendship. 
One of the differences is that, in case of a disagreement on both sides, to the credit of the Bolsheviks, they can say, we will personally bear the consequences of a similar policy with the Armenian people, because we find ourselves in the area of the tragedy. We would not be interested in the tragedy born or to be borne by individuals, especially for those who have not tasted the Turkish yoke and want to taste it, or if that tragedy was limited only to those responsible ones. But unfortunately, the evidence is that often the responsible individuals defect and the people become the eternal and inevitable victims. In our opinion, those who consciously see hope in Turkish-Armenian friendship are unconsciously enemies of the Armenians. And, apart from outside plots, the responsibility for tomorrow's new bloodshed before such a step is taken falls first of all on the Armenians. The Bolshevik Armenian is so enthused about his friend Kemalji that he does not see what is transpiring in his bosom against his life and he offers us internal conspiracies under the label of peaceful and brotherly existence. He is a friend of the Turk proletarian by affirmation, who considers the victim as a tribesman of forceful dominion. Politically, he is a friend of Kemal, and no matter how much he considers him an enemy from a social class standpoint, he pretends to deceive him. What do the Armenians of Diaspora think who are partisans of the same policy. By affirmation, it would seem, they have the same belief about the Turk proletarian, except that they are afraid to utter the name Turk when protecting the gains of the proletarians. That fear is sufficient unto itself to demonstrate that they do not express themselves in the same way as those who know the Turks well. Politically, they have the same pretension that they can deceive the Turks. Here, also, they are fearful, because they avoid giving the name of the Turk and hides behind the name Committee of Caucasian Peoples. They know that this committee is a Kemalist committee. Its leaders are the same people who devour Armenians, who speak directly with the Bolsheviks and indirectly negotiate with non-Bolsheviks and anti-Bolsheviks. Therefore, there is no difference in principle and even in modus operandi around this issue. The difference between us and the representatives of that mindset is that since, by affirmation, we do not believe in any friendship with the Turk, we do not pretend to have the capability of deceiving the Turk. Consequently, we consider both sides as enemies of the Armenians regarding this question, with the distinction that we view one with the mask of lewd audacity and the other with that fearful wickedness. And we ask boldly, if Turk-Armenian friendship can save Armenian life and bring about peace, it is in greater measure applied by means of the Bolsheviks, officially and governmentally ratified by the Russian seal. Why then should the same attempt be made with another line to give more guarantee to the Turks about our sincerity, or to intersect the same affirmation. There is, however, one horrific reality in this bilateral line around the same Turk friendship. The Bolshevik admits Turkish friendship with Armenia under the protection of Russia. The non-Bolshevik wants the Turkish friendships with Armenia under the protection of Turkey. The words Caucasian peoples are only ruses to deceive the Armenian people, and the crime committed on this ground has no name. From the viewpoint of the latter, it means that the Turks are more sincere in their friends toward the Armenians than the Russians. More correctly, they are less hypocritical than the Russians. This means that tomorrow, when the same Turkish friendship arrives with unconditional Turkishness, Oh, that day of carnage, Armenia and the Armenians will be more peaceful and prosperous than today. It means, at the very least, in answer to the deception of Caucasian peoples, that the Azeris and the Turks of Dagestan and the Georgians will protect the Armenians more in the name of Turkish friendship. Either yes or no. 
As for us who know the Turks very well, a hundred times better, with every single drop of our blood, and by generations, we declare boldly that Turk-Armenian friendship did not exist, does not exist, and will not exist. It does not exist because if that friendship is going to give life to the Armenians, it is going to give death to the Turks. The Turks are not going to learn this thing from us. And it is unnatural that anyone should wish to give life to another with his own death, in the name of any friendship, especially to the enemy. And if he's going to give life to the Turks, he's going to give death to us, the Armenians, and he's going to give life to the Turks. And this is what we have understood with our deaths of yesterday and agonies of today. We have learned this from the Turks, but the diplomats of Turk-Armenian friendship have not understood and try to understand through the final annihilation of the Armenians. Our unconditional conviction is that Turkish-Armenian friendship, both by Bolshevik and anti-Bolshevik roads, comes to an end at the Armenian hell. And we clamour more in the face of this nation-destroying ignorance that the Armenian Bolshevik is a Turkish collaborator hiding his unbecoming face behind a red veil, and the non-Bolshevik or anti-Bolshevik Armenian supporting the same policy is no different than the Georgian veil for the fearful head. Conscious or unconscious, the evidence does not change, and there is no justification nor excuse for the crimes of diplomacy committed or to be committed. Even Armenian brains, which dissolve the tangles of Turkish-Armenian relations, are just now perceiving in terror the Turkish woven web of fifty years, and close their eyes not to see its horror, and to stand and pretend to deceive the Turks with this tragic Armenian ignorance, to put on airs of emerging as more diplomatic, would be unqualifiedly ludicrous if it were not hellishly tragic. And finally, why not shed that pretension and not to accept the fact that on political grounds the Turks are far ahead of us? It is not a fault of which we should be ashamed, but let us be ashamed that we are attempting deceit. Diplomacy is a more refined science than any science, and its university is governmental life. To consider the Turks experienced for centuries in this university by their blood more ignorant than the Armenians, and to pretend on this ground to compete with them, would be similar to give lessons in analysis for a linguist to a shepherd who is illiterate. Until today, we have not understood that the Turk village headsman is more of a politician than the greatest Armenian diplomat, only because governmental life, independently and even without his knowledge, has moulded him, while we have always buried the sin of our ignorance in diplomacy, that is, deceit, and backwardness in foreign plots, and today, at least if we were aware, we would have gained one very essential thing. We would have grasped the lesson of our age-old bloodshed, and that lesson would in some measure have fulfilled our diplomatic lack, independently from our will, the consequence would have been that we would have seen our certain death in Turk friendship. We would have avoided that friendship, whose only proven aim is to chain the hands of the Armenians, to imprison and axe him. And in the end, we would have been motivated to find the means of surviving until one day we would become politicians. It is possible for Armenians to make attempts at diplomacy with anyone, even with the inevitable condition of always being deceived, but not with the Turks. The first can give us afflictions of the deceived, but it can teach one very great philosophy as much hope as you put on someone else, your rights regarding his responsibility proportionately fewer. However little hope, so much great are your rights. The second can only bring us death. Chapter 9 who is responsible for Armenian tragedies? We will in no way have negated the fault and responsibility of the outsider for our tragedies if we repeat and emphasize that as much hope as we place on the outsider, 
no matter who that outsider is, so much less are our rights to speak about the responsibility of the outsider. On the contrary, and so in this very basic principle, the Turks are much more intelligent than the Armenians. And the application of this principle has been one of the reasons for their victory, as well as our defeat, because that, independently from all other suppositions, has not only turned the Turks into a value in the eyes of the outside world, but also has made it possible for the Turkish womb to give birth to Mustafa Kemal's. Is it possible to ever equate even the greatest Turkish tragedy with the smallest of the Armenian tragedies? The proof is that they were able to give birth to Kemal, who created a nation. We don't want to doubt the fertility of the Armenian womb, because a similar doubt would not only negate the suffering of the God-created force that Armenians had and have, but also the existence of the epic heroes whose ranks would bring honor to any nation. An Andranik was no less a hero than a Kemal. But when the one became a Ghazi, we the Armenians knocked the other from stone to stone. If the reverence shown to his casket was worthy of his greatness, we did not see that it also demonstrated the criminal backwardness of the Armenians. Andranik did not die. We killed him. That is what his casket was replying. But our nation creation is so obtuse and deaf that we did not hear. Let us also say more. As an Armenian, Andranik also did not realize that he would be killed one day, the day that he held his soldier at gunpoint for slaughtering a Turk, when the Kemalists were decorating the chests of their soldiers for slaughtering Armenians. Law has its verdict. And in knowing this law, Armenians are behind Turks, and Andranik is behind Kemal. No matter how numerous the foreign plots and responsibilities, no matter how fertile and hero-bearing the Armenian womb, we will be defeated, and were defeated, because we did not know that law. We were afraid that the outsider would call us a beast. The Turks were not afraid of such words, whose value they had analyzed. We prayed, always repeating, He who takes up the sword falls by the sword. The Turk greeted his Allah with sword bared and bloodstained. Let us recapitulate. All of these are expressions of grasping or not knowing the law. What are we doing today to show that we have understood the law now? We repeat, that which we did yesterday and were defeated and always putting our hope on the outsider, we only complain when the outsider, having forgotten his pain and gain, does not suffer like us with our pain and gain. Yes, the outsider has many faults in our regard. Yes, the outsider has many ties with us, independently from our strengths. He is not Armenian. He looks at objects as they are and gives them the value they deserve. Let us neither be surprised or angered that they gave the Turks Lausanne and are giving them Geneva, while they give us the price of emptiness. That is our price and our value. Let us accept at least today, independently from outside speculation, that as goods on the political front, we did not value ourselves more. This self-knowledge is in no way the denial of the categorizations by the elders and the mighty. Burn the volumes of such La Police truisms, as well as the sharp and a somewhat crude exhibition of our worth and of the price tag hung from our breast by our hand. What things we could have done, but we did not do them even to publicize our price for the value of our suffering for the eyes of the world's super-powerful. Who restrained our hand from throwing the terrorist bomb? Who suppressed our soul from shattering all the doors with the vengeance of our blood in lieu of a tear-stained piece of paper? All those who claim the outsider will reply are wrong. They are all deceivers who will read sermons about the outsider. We, we, and we broke our own hands, demoralized our spirits, and turned into mediating sellers of Armenian blood, falling from door to door, pleading like beggars for the price. 
inconsequential exiles to the four winds. That is what we are worth. We can cry if we wish, or lament. No matter how sainted they are, the dead are not owners or sellers of their earthly goods. They cannot be, and we weep because the foreign buyer will not pay more than the value of sand for our bones, pulverized in the desert sands. We are angered by his valuing the slithering snake more and paying a price for the animal skin. He will pay the price to the seller and not to the beggar who witnesses the transaction with tearful eyes. How is our status today different from that of the beggar? Would that we were inhabitants of that cemetery today. Perhaps wild and demonized, they would bargain with us and finally give us a price. Could we not have been? We could have. But we declined because we did not comprehend the bitter law that in order to be, the other, at least the Turk, would not be. And even today we, the marginalized and not even the mentally depleted, have not understood. And we wait for the outsider, always the outsider, to appreciate us more than a Georgian or a Turk. And we console ourselves only with that, one day, the Turk will be sold with our price. Yes, that day, when the Turk reaches our ignorance, they will also pay him the same price. And this hope has its sweetness for us, without doubt. But even the sweetest hope is still not salvation. The most important is what we should do in order to realize that hope. Do we have the right to wait for the outsider to realize our hope? The Turks know very well how they conduct business publicly, and they try to keep their prices high. In the face of each crisis of failure and bankruptcy, they put some goods or furniture, a jewel from a crown or an oil well, on the market. And we know that these are bought always with the hue, cry and pomp which deafen our outcries. We are again in the role of weepers, with pleading voices, because we could not cut the hand of the buyer before the eyes of the world, and to burn a sold oil well. It is true that the buying hand is not just one, nor is the oil well one, but even one has value, a symbol of the knowledge of law, which we should have at least deepened until today, that there is always a buyer when there is a seller. Therefore, the seller cannot exist. The seller, the Turk, exists, unfortunately, and he exists because we wanted it so. What we were obliged to do, we wanted the outsider to do. We were satisfied with what the outsider did, with the damage brought about by the outsider. We did so yesterday, and we are behaving so today. We were defeated yesterday, and we will be defeated tomorrow. That is all we are worth. Chapter 10. An offence committed is an act permitted. As straight the line with which you approach your tasks, the outsider will have that much less opportunity to interfere in your steps. A fait accompli has the additional opportunity to resolve an issue to the benefit of the doer. Thus is one of the mottos of political life, in which the Turks have demonstrated incomparable abilities to the Armenians. The significant proverb, Kaba hatiolende mi, eol durende mi, which contains the answer, eolende, has the wisdom of age-old experience within it. The Talmudic meaning that, if a man commits an offence and repeats it, it becomes, in his eyes, something permitted. And indeed, the killer can always have the opportunity to be freed from fault, because he lives while even the most innocent victim, contrary to all arguments, is dead. Antiquated watchwords have no place in the creativity of nations. No matter how sainted the deceased may be, he's at most worthy of one hour. The comment refers to the speaking tongue, and they only speak with it. That is why, over a decade of losses, the Turks learned how possible it is to give as little opportunity to the outsider and the Armenians yesterday, 
and today they deal with others in such a way that the interference of the outsider comes after the deed is done. The result of that knowledge is that it even has the beneficial verdict of our friendly outsiders. And on that ground, it is the result of our ignorance that the remaining part is our tears and gnashing of teeth. It is with the application of this principle that the Armenians represent an exiled emptiness, while the Turks represent nationhood. A helping hand and a piece of bread offered to the Armenian is now tedium and boredom. The armchairs of the Palace of Nations in Geneva are too little. Did we want it to be otherwise? Knowing the law, the Turks were aware that it should be so. And they were right. Neither our Jeremiah's nor anything else can change that diplomatic law. We, the ignorant and the pitiful fearful, are the only ones who do not comprehend what the respectful reception of the Rushdis to Geneva during the days of Kurdish slaughters wanted to teach in the silence of Armenian tombs. Let us repeat, these words of ours are not a negation of many foreign deceptions, nor a denial of the thought of having hope from the outsider, but only an emphasis of that Armenian ignorance which still did not grasp that everything connected to it is related to it and is responsible for it. We remembered the Kurds, a little about the Kurds, as outsiders. Shall we repeat that our comments are not a denial of any outside help? Whoever wants to argue or provoke, let him know from the start that we know as much as anyone that we are not alone on that planet. Therefore, we are connected by many strings, against our will, and will remain connected with the outsider. The Kurds, in our opinion, are as foreign to us as any outsider. If they have tasted the same yoke, if they have the same pains, they have against that advantage the fact that they slaughtered us, and will also have the natural and inevitable necessity of striking against us. The coming days will demonstrate this, if we live to see them, their neighborliness and similarity of pain with us cannot negate their foreignness, at least to the extent that they do not die for our struggle, as no outsider would do. They will fight, will slaughter, and be slaughtered for their freedom. And it is fortunate that they will not be slaughtered like the Armenians. Do we have any right to expect from the Kurds and their struggle that which we expected and did not receive from the Russian, the English, and the French. And do we have the right tomorrow to expect from a Kurdish victory that they give us what we expect? If the Kurds are freed and they will one day be liberated, apart from all outside admonitions, they are going to be first and foremost the ones who will make themselves worthy of liberation. And let it be very clear, on the very first day that they reach their goal, they will strive to curdify us. None of our sermons nor our advice will help, because they will see that nations are organized this way and survive thus. Our consolation will once again be the slaughter of a few more Turks and the loss of a little more land within the Turkish boundaries. This consolation is not altogether valueless, but it is not that which will add value to us, because there is no worth to rejoicing over the victory of an outsider, especially for Armenians. Nor is it dominion of rights. The damage and destruction of the Turks is a gain for Armenians under all circumstances. The loss of Mesopotamia, as well as of Syria, is a gain for us. A little more tomorrow, the loss of Kurdistan, each one in proportion to the force with which it reflects on the destruction of the Turks. Tomorrow, an Italian war and the loss of Smyrna are a gain for us, but none of them is our salvation. Such is that which will serve as a measure for our hopes. Anything beyond that is going to reserve new disappointments and complaints against the plots of new friends. The most tragic, however, will be that we depend on the hopes of damage to the Turks by any outsider, be they English, Italian, 
or curd, and do not do that which we can do, and we can do many things, many things independently from all the outsiders, who will do and are doing everything possible without us, without our desires and advice, because they are more intelligent than we, and they know that this is foreign to them, and that the outsider is always foreign. Finally, there is an incomprehensible and most sacred mindset, except for the iron law of diplomacy. Where is the manliness of that spirit which can satisfy the exchange of millions of martyrs with the victory of the Kurds or any other outsider? To see the defeat of the enemy is joyful, but to defeat the enemy with one's own hand is the ultimate degree of satisfaction, which we call spiritual manliness. That manliness is always compared inversely to the hope placed on the outsider, and so that we can gradually begin to learn both that diplomatic law as well as bring virility to that state of mind. Our hopes on the outsider must diminish to the lowest degree. Our enthusiasm must remain within the boundaries of joy for the damage to the enemy by the hand of others. These writings of ours are more strictly audacious confessions of our weakness and backwardness. Therefore, let us not douse our fiery principles with the justifications for complementing our weaknesses. To complement weakness with an outsider is one thing, to succumb to another is something else. Here also, yesterday and today, the Armenians have brought the literature of the first to the negativity of the second. And we do not doubt that tomorrow we will be deceived by the Kurds, because it seems that they are more knowledgeable than we in the business of creating a nation. The only evidence of this is that the Kurds behave in the same way as the Turks behave with us and behave with them. They slaughter women and children. They pillage villages and cities. It is sufficient to give the illiterate mountaineer Kurds more attention and to believe in his struggle for liberation. We who have the pretension of teaching something to the Kurds, in our opinion, have much to learn even from the Kurds. Under the best of circumstances, our position is not so different from the village school teachers, before whom many abacadarium readers have become university students. A similar position is neither spiritual virtue nor its pride just. Perhaps one day those university students may celebrate the jubilee of their teacher, a jubilee equal in value to a eulogy. And in our opinion, they have no right to expect more, and they are not worthy to receive it even from the Kurds as outsiders, all those who believe in receiving from the Kurds their political life and nation. There is one person who is non-treasonous in your works, and that is you yourself. It is your energy. As profound as that belief is, so the treason of the outsider diminishes. Neither smallness nor weakness can breach that law. Does not life dictate that we grasp this law, even within the boundaries of our strength, less than the Turks and Kurds? Chapter 11 Actions Speak Louder Than Words Another publicly emphasized difference between the Turks and us is the evidence that while they work, we talk. And what is the saddest is that talking and writing has become work for us. To limit all those provocations which are going to deluge public opinion against our minds, let us declare that we never negate the strength and value of the platform or the press. They have their place, but there is a very basic point which we have ignored in our writings and speeches the pen and the tongue gain their strength only from the fist. That is what the Turks know and utilize better than we Armenians. And if we add to this principle that which is different and must be different in the manner of speaking and writing within the governmental life of a nation and a revolutionary people striving to be liberated, then not only will those admonitions lose their force, that the Turks have more of a platform and a press than we, but will also emphasize the futility of our manner of speaking and writing. Finally, 
What do our platforms and press truly represent? If they play a role in our internal life, if, in small measure, they justify their existence, let us confess that they are categorically useless for the outside world. Take any newspaper. What Jew editorials will you not find settling the destiny of the political world? And neither the editor nor the reader ever questions. In the end, who reads these articles? Point Carré, Mussolini or Lloyd George do not want to lead with our political wisdom. As for that hue and cry, the Jeremiahs and curses, with which our newspapers are so full, the repetitions of our woes and deceptions, which for even Armenians have become wearisome, that no one know what they are for. How many years have we been weeping and screaming? They deceived us. They said Armenia, but did not keep their word. They promised homes, but did not deliver. They converted the Armenian cause into a question of exile. They even saw the steps of Russia. The Nansen plan even moved us. They suggest Argentina. They send us to Peru. Liars, depraved, rogues. We never questioned even one day. Who reads those accounts? Who, even if he reads, our comment is about the outsider, understands... Even if he understands, who would exchange all of this with more than a smile? And if all of this is for the Armenians, in our opinion, each and every Armenian knows his pain more and knows the roguery of the outsider. And all this hue and cry does not change a hair of our being or of the behavior of the outsider. If we repeated everything with this in mind, that we are not afraid to conclude and declare that all of this happened and will happen because we deserve it, we would have said something new and true. And if we said those new and true words, and from that we fearlessly deduced the audacious and just verdict that we must henceforth be worth more than a mite and be worthy by our own means, our press and editors would have assumed their roles. The picture is before our eyes. They make us cry, and we cry. With our cries we work so that others wipe our tears, declaring at the same time that others are deceivers and rogues, and they will never wipe our tears. The Turks make our seven generations cry, and then they begin to justify their actions, with certainty that in political life the right is theirs, which implements and then speaks in defence. We may write and speak what we want. Tomorrow we will be reconciled, even with the concept of Peru. Did we not formally moan about many things, and then became reconciled? If we do not know the language of work, let us be reconciled with our demise. Empty groans do not increase our sins by more than one insult. It is shameful. One bullet has the force of a thousand newspapers, or orations. Without negating the role of various attempts, we repeat that one act is worth a thousand words. For example, let us just say, without negating the value of the efforts in America, where we have the only really foreign propaganda organ, the Press Bureau, that one bullet would have more effectively and directly solved the questions of the Lausanne Treaty and would have been more valuable than thousands of pamphlets than what has happened in ten years. We did not yet understand that, except for the Turkish government and the admonitions emanating therefrom, there is also in Turkey the basic premise of the task of annihilating the Armenians. One man, one Mukhtar Bey, succeeds in neutralizing from one day to the next and subjecting to defeat our ten-year efforts. Let us not condemn America, which forgets its words and sells our blood. If 150,000 Armenians did not prove they are not goods for sale, the seller is not to blame. Therefore, if we count the futile efforts we have made in every corner of the world, the value of all of which we Armenians could have made ourselves, believe that we could have bought Armenia only with an amount of money, if we had known the extent of our death 
and the horror of our behavior, we would have talked less about the responsibilities of the outsiders, and our word would have been action. The Armenians would have once again been criminals, barbarians, and beasts. Why were we not able to understand that the criminal and beast are worth more than a mite? Their blood is not put up for sale, but they are treated with respect. Either our tears and grief are lies and falsehoods before our situation, or we do not grasp it in reality. Otherwise, the Armenians, especially today, would have been the first audacious ones of the world's peoples. He who has nothing to lose has nothing to fear, and Armenians have nothing to lose. But they are the most afraid, unfortunately. Since it is so, whether we cry or grieve, we will also go to Peru, and even further still, because we are only worthy of that, and we made ourselves worthy alone. Chapter 12. Woe to those who fail to understand. Superficial comments on the evidence are sufficient enough to bring to light in an emphatic manner the part of Armenian responsibility for our tragedies. The negation is in no way toward foreign or external responsibilities, and, which is most important, to invite us to see the uselessness and failure of those used and rusty weapons, whose use in the past may have been an offence, but stubbornly clinging to them today is a crime. With these pages, our purpose is to openly declare that in our inevitable battle for existence is a wrestling match for the force of the criminal Turk, striving to annihilate the Armenians entirely, and for the expiring force with the purpose of establishing an Armenian nation. The Armenian people are going to be guilty by clinging to antiquated weapons, and their leadership villainous for lulling them with lullabies of old weapons and means. Our old weapons, revolvers and bombs, no matter how much they will have kept their value circumstantially, are worn out now. Our antiquated means are to place entirely the hopes of our struggle on outsiders, be they governments or rebel elements. No matter how valuable a tool they may be from the viewpoint of harming our true and principal enemy, the Turks, they will never cease from disappointing and conspiring against us. Let us repeat that these comments in no way have the nature of negating the greater or lesser value of those weapons, but are made only so that we concentrate on moving forward. Our battle for existence by our means, always available and uncorrupted. Let us not think and talk, because we are criminally guilty, if we have not yet, though, but are working with them. The horror of enemy plans and the frightfulness of our struggle do not yet demonstrate that we have no hope of fighting or even to conquer. This declaration belongs to those who are either terrified or with hands folded are appealing to death or who offer new watchwords in order not to terrify with words or despair, or to be terrorized by diplomacy. Just as we are not afraid to declare the existence of our battle for existence, let us not be afraid as well to proclaim that the Armenian people have arrived to that point when they are justified now to apply the words of Belgium's Cardinal Mercier. After this war, in the case of violating the Armenians' right, no one is entitled to blame them if they become unruly as a nation. Let us also accept that those mysteries which serve only in veiling emptiness and those cautions and prudence are false from the standpoint of keeping our weapons a secret, declaring that Armenians have the right not to put conditions in weaponry and to shout this affirmation in the face of the world does not signify exhibiting weapons, accepting and even declaring to the entire Armenian people that Armenians can overcome the Turks with neither army, political propaganda, bomb, cannon or glider, does not mean revealing the secret of weaponry, but means keeping the Armenians informed about their weaknesses, about the enemy's strength and preventing them from wasting their energies uselessly. 
and to muster them to secure weapons which minimize our weaknesses. For example, let us say that no matter how beautiful is the image of the flight of the Armenian revolutionary and the ruinous bombing of the criminal cell of Enkuri, but we must accept the fact that this is not a basic means, nor a weapon which falls within our energies. We cannot have gliders if we do not even have an airfield. And even if we had an airfield, one Turkish anti-glider bomb would be sufficient to invalidate all of our sacrifices and lovely dreams. This example is so that we have the knowledge of our strength and use our energies in the right place. Glory be to the human brain and to the power of science who prevented us from praying to science when today the entire world has put its talent to the service of scientific means. What good were the world's complaints raised against the first German inhumane gas attacks? The Germans complemented the weakness of their powers with a weapon which, though inhumane, became as a humane military weapon for war as one rifle. And so, today, the number and kind of gas weapons are counted by the thousands. But the concept of Armenian humaneness, contrary to every inhumane means in giving millions of victims, still remains clinging to old papers, which, except for us, have been thrown in the trash by the whole world. Oh, our pretension! which puts on airs of giving lessons to the entire world. Shall we remain so naive as to believe that tomorrow, in the event of a new war, even new inhumane means will not become extraordinarily humane? Did the Bolsheviks not make attempts to discover the way to destroy the enemy, with bombs and with poisonous gas, as well as with the germs of contagious disease? and they speak and write and do experiments about these things every day, we are not only not so naive as to believe that a similar Bolshevik attempt will not make as much noise as the German gas experiment, and that they will not be thought of as more beastly than the Germans, but we also dare to declare that whoever lulls the Armenians with antiquated sermons of humanness or with false ways of dissipating vengeful Armenian thinking, always in the quest of more than inhumane weapons, is the biggest criminal in this liberating battle for the existence of the Armenian people. No one, no nation or people, has the right to devote their mind in a dedicated manner than the Armenians, because no one has been slaughtered so inhumanely, was betrayed and annihilated, and is expiring. And no nation or people is so weak and needs to complement its weaknesses even eternally with the most inhumane weapons. This right receives the justification of its existence from our victims and from the sanctity of our battle for existence. We must, however, never forget the million martyrs and to be the dedicated soldiers of our battle for existence. After that, the horror of the struggle for this battle for existence not only will be unable to shatter our fists in despair, but will give us the godliness of horror for our destined struggle, which this time justly and truly would spit in the face of the world, standing on the enemy's corpses. If we were to resign from the greatly baseless and truly very few advantages that we have, and believed in the possibility, as we are convinced, and exercised a pretension in the arena of inhumaneness, that being the most just right, it would also be the only one to turn us into men, nation, and government. Our strength in inhumaneness must only outweigh the powers of the enemy. Thus we must affirm, and thus we must wage our battle for existence, which, together with all plots and enmities, has as a collaborator against us. Time. Woe to he who does not understand, for he will be the vanquished.